1990, four years before he signed a minor league contract to become a Chicago White Sox farmhand, Michael Jordan put on a Sox uniform and took batting practice. A year later, Upper Deck released the 1991 Michael Jordan SP1 as part of its baseball set. Jordan wearing the Sox uniform, taking BP. The card essentially became what today would be called his XRC, but in 1991, it was just a cool novelty. And that, folks, is where today's story begins. Because like for so many in the hobby, Michael Jordan plays a key role in my collecting experience. But it's not for the typical reasons. I am not a Jordan collector. I will never be a Jordan collector. I think his 86 Fleer is not only boring and overproduced, but it's not even his rookie card. So how does Jordan play into my hobby experience? And more importantly, what can it tell all of us about being responsible collectors? Well, I'm Dave Schwartz, Iowa Dave on Instagram. And Michael Jordan's Baseball XRC is the topic of today's episode of The Shallow End. Born and raised in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri, West County. We were an unincorporated town. There was no name for the suburb. So the mailing address was just St. Louis, which is kind of cool. My room was sort of just a typical childhood room, fairly small, room for a bed and a desk and a bookshelf and a closet. And the entire right side of my closet as I grew older, progressively began to fill up with sports cards, mostly baseball cards, a little football, a little basketball, but almost entirely baseball cards. Well, in 2019, those cards were still sitting there. I had long, long since gotten out of the hobby, but my parents were pretty patient about things. They didn't need a lot of room. Um, And if they needed to free up some space, then they could move a few things around, but they never really needed that part of the closet. And so my cards just sat there. And so round 19 is when I started to realize that uh, cards, sports cards, were making it back into the public consciousness. And I had dabbled with getting back into it in the past. I would browse eBay every now and then and really, really wanted to get uh, a 53 top Satchel Page because he's wearing that St. Louis Browns hat. And obviously a Satchel Page is legendary and I like all things St. Louis sports, but I never really pulled the trigger. And I thought maybe now is the time to go through these cards and see what I've got. Maybe I can sell some off and Help the family. It might be kind of fun. I never thought that I was going to get back into collecting. And so on a really warm late fall weekend, my family and I went down to visit my dad and loaded probably between 30 and 40,000 cards into the back of our Honda Pilot. Just kind of going through them very briefly at that moment because I didn't really have time to really sift through them. Uh, maybe really nostalgic for for that time. But I hadn't really been hooked yet, right? What I did find, though, what I did find when I got back is I had about 12 to 15 cards that I had put into top loaders. So congratulations, young me. Even back in the late 80s and early 90s, I was preserving my cards in top loaders. And one of them was this 1991 upper deck Michael Jordan taking batting practice in a White Sox uniform. So what I decided to do is I decided to send it was about eight or nine cars and I sent them off to PSA and I had no idea what I was doing. This was early 2020. 
the website was fine. I kind of knew how to package them. I put them in the right kind of holders and I sent them off. And this was, uh, I think my newest card, my most recent card was um, the foil Alex Rodriguez uh, rookie card. Um, a Ken Griffey Jr. upper deck, of course. It was those types of cards that I was sending off to get graded. Um, 1980 Ricky Henderson tops rookie card, that sort of stuff. Um, as this was late 19 and early 20, the pandemic was coming, but nobody knew it was coming. It was just this thing that we heard about in the news that was happening in a different part of the world, and I mean, none of us knew how bad this was going to be, right? Um, anyway, I sent whatever it was, 9 or 10 or 12 cards off to PSA. And this was before the logjam happened. So thankfully, they were back in about three months. And of those 10 or 11 or 12 cards, um, most were PSA 8 or 9 that that a rod card I had was a seven. I did not understand why, because at the time I understood nothing essentially. But I got back two PSA tens. One was a 1983 Don Russ Tony Gwynn rookie, and the other ten was the Jordan was the Jordan upper deck 91 card of him taking batting practice. And I didn't realize just how meaningful and how significant to my hobby experience that this was going to be. I just thought, okay, maybe I can make some extra money for it. But really, at the time, I just didn't understand why the other cards weren't tens. They all looked fine to me. But, you know, maybe that's a story for another episode, but certainly not for today. So I did some research, and I started trying to figure out how to post cards on eBay to maximize interest, buy it now versus auction, and all of these things. And... Um, I put seven or eight up at first, and it went fine. They, you know, the hobby was starting to boom a little bit. This was now um, the middle of 2020, and prices were soaring. Right, they were just they were going up. I wasn't buying anything at the time, but I was just happy to see that people had an interest in buying these cards. As for some of my other stuff. A lot of the commons, I'll be honest, I recycled. This, this was the junk wax era, and I had thousands and thousands and thousands of late 80s and early 90s junk wax. I didn't know what Com C was, and I don't think anybody would even pay a penny for these cards anyway, and so I would recycle so many of these cards. But the ones that I knew had some value, I kept. Um... There, there were no. There's, there's nothing that I look back now and think I can't believe I threw that away or I recycled that. I, I knew what was good. I knew what was good, and I knew what wasn't, to a degree. So now I've got this dozen or so graded cards, and I start selling them off, and it's great. The money's coming in. I'm putting it into our checking account. It's helping to pay for groceries. You know, it's fantastic. But for whatever reason, I just hold on to this Jordan. I'm holding on to the 91 Jordan PSA 10. Why? I'm, I'm not the biggest Jordan fan. I, I watched him like everybody else. I, the NBA on NBC, it seemed like Jordan was on every single weekend. Um, I was in United Center in Chicago, Saturday, January 19th, 2002. That was Jordan's first game back in Chicago as a member of the Washington Wizards. And the ovation that he got was incredible. I closed my eyes just to listen to it because I didn't want to have other senses, like like sight, disable what it is I was trying to do that day. I was just trying to, to hear it. I recorded it. And for years, I would occasionally find the recording and I would play it back of the sound that Jordan got when he was introduced in Chicago, even though. He was a member of a different team by that point. It was one of those awful, awful early 2000s games where it was all defense and the offensive rules had not opened up yet. Washington won that game 77-69. to It was terrible. Jordan scored 16 on 7 of 21 shooting. Just a terrible game. All the action, 
was in the tunnel uh, inside United Center as Jordan walked in before the game wearing his finely manicured, tailored suits. And of course, from North Carolina, Michael Jordan. That's what I remember about that game. But even though I was there, even though I'd watched him, it just, Jordan and I never clicked. Not for lack of respect of what he accomplished. It just, you know, it wasn't my thing. But I held on to that card nonetheless. Until one day, I finally decided to list it. And I was really nervous about doing it. And perhaps that's why I didn't list it sooner, is because I knew that either that or the 83 Gwyn was going, which the, the Don Russ 83 Gwyn PSA 10 that I got, I knew that if I didn't list it right, if I listed it at the wrong time, the wrong day, that I was not going to get full value for it. And I wanted to be sure to do that. Well, the Gwyn worked out. Then I sold the 1980 Topps Ricky Henderson, which got a PSA 8, which is one of only about two cards now. Um, that I've sold in the last three plus years that I ever wish I wish I had not sold that. I decided it was finally time to sell this Jordan. And so I knew that Sunday evenings were the best time to post it. I started thinking, do I want to go in the 7 o'clock range, the 8 o'clock range? If I go too late, I lose some of the East Coast buyers. If I go too early, I lose or I rather I, I whiff on some of the West Coast buyers. And so I remember vividly that I posted it for 8.02 p.m. to be posted on a Sunday. And at the time, these PSA 10s were going for somewhere between $650 and $700. I post it, and within about 10 minutes, it has four bids is up to $100. Great, but I've posted it for a week, right? And so... That became one of the longest weeks in my obby life. I, I checked it way too much. I didn't know at that time that all the bids come in at the beginning and at the end. And so when I wasn't getting as many bids on the card on Tuesday, on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, I thought, oh, I knew it. I blew it. I blew it. I'm going to get about 250 bucks for this card. It's going to be an absolute waste. I don't know what I'm doing. What did I even think about trying to make some money off this? Well, I was wrong. This was the boom. I didn't know what the boom was, but we are now fully in the hobby boom. And this was a Michael Jordan PSA 10. It could have been a picture of him sitting on the toilet PSA 10, and it probably would have gotten at least 500 bucks, right? Well, I'm hoping for about 650 for this White Sox batting practice card. And it's getting closer to that 8 o'clock range on Sunday night. And lo and behold, the price starts going up. 350 450, 500. Once it hit 500, I breathed a sigh of relief. I thought, well, I'm not going to get to 650, but 500 bucks is still fantastic for a card that, you know, six months ago I forgot that I even had. And now it's going to be something that the family can use. Finally it comes around, and everyone's starting to put their snipe bids in at the very end, and eBay starts to refresh meaning that the time has ended, and I'm going to see now what the final price is. And the final price pops up at just over $800. And I was ecstatic. This is fantastic. And then a different thought entered my head. And this was a crossroads in my collecting life. Because what I decided to do in that moment, when that price came across and when especially when the payment came through and then there it was is I decided I wanted to start collecting a few cards again so I uh, talked to my wife and said yeah I think I'm gonna start collecting a little bit you don't mind do you and she was just totally supportive and said no yeah go for it uh, how much do you think you want to spend on it and I said not much, you know, a few bucks here and there. I, I think I enjoy this. I think I want to do this a little bit more. But I think I'm just going to work off this card I just sold because that way it doesn't come out of our our family funds that we need for mortgage and grocery and everything else. And she's like, okay, sure, whatever. I think I was more nervous about bringing it up than she was, and she's 
fantastic partner in life and just wanted me to be happy. And so at that point on, I was operating completely in the black. And I was starting from a place of zero debt, and now I had this pool of money. That is how this entire collecting journey started with Jordan. This PSA 10 baseball card of Michael Jordan, who had not yet even won his first ring, putting on a White Sox uniform and taking batting practice on the south side of Chicago. And from there, as I got more involved in the hobby, I decided this is how it needs to be. To be a responsible collector, to honor my family, to honor my wife, my partner, who supported me in getting into this. This was my way of making this a zero-debt hobby, of becoming a completely self-sustained hobbyist, meaning that all funds for cards come through cards. If I take a loss, then that's on me. Then that comes out of my collection. If I'm able to sell some and make a little bit of profit, some I'll put back to the family, most I'll put back to the family, but some goes right back into the cards. And what I found is, is when that's where my leverage and my liquidity comes from when it comes from the hobby itself so much of the stress and the anxiety that I hear others having and understandably having because money and emotions can cause anxiety I feel anxiety sometimes I think we all do both the clinical kind and and just the kind that comes with stress right by having my collection come from this one card and knowing that I'm not taking 2% of my monthly income or 5% of whatever, that it comes completely from one card and has since grown out because I was fortunate enough to come into the hobby at a time when it was growing and by sheer studiousness and some luck, I was able to figure out when the right times to sell were. And so when I did get a card or some cards that I knew had some value, and if I wasn't emotionally tied with them, I knew thanks to some early podcasts that I had listened to, such as Sports Card Nonsense and Cards to the Moon, I knew the right time to sell. And that built my war chest. That built and grew my ability to get some more interesting cards. Not to get back too far to it again, but it, a couple weeks ago in my in my first episode, I talked about how at the beginning I was buying a whole bunch of crap, and I was I was just I was just learning about the hobby again. I had been out for a quarter century, and I was buying everything that seemed shiny and fun and different. But once I got back into the hobby after several months, I I learned certain things about it, and I learned what I liked, and so I started trading away or selling off the stuff that I collected early on that I realized I didn't want. I didn't care about Darius Garland. I didn't care about Tyler Hero. I didn't care about Vlad Guerrero Jr. I didn't care about Lamar Jackson. I didn't care about Bryce Harper. And I'm glad that I realized that when I did, but I still had all these cards that I didn't know what to do with, and so I started selling those uh, through uh, eBay and through Twitter, uh, where I used to have a, a heavier presence and started being able to refocus my collection. But the whole time that I was able to refocus, I was still, in the back of my mind, operating from this original pool that started with that Jordan card. You know, the sickest I ever felt in this hobby, the worst day, uh, came right around then. I had uh, sold a uh, a lot of Mark McGuire cards, which is funny because now Mark McGuire is one of the players who actually I do collect today. But I sold a lot of McGuire cards, of about five or six McGuire cards, over eBay. And the person who bought them had bought for me before 
He was professional. Professional. He was reputable. And uh, he messages me to let me know that the USA 1985 Topps Mark McGuire card, the one that's regarded as sort of like his rookie or another XRC, that was sort of the prime card of the lot that he bought because it looked amazing. It looked centered. Um, corners were sharp. It was, it, 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 I thought it had a legitimate chance of getting, a, of gemming a PSA 10. And he messages me to say that he bought it from me and he sent it off for grading and it came back as counterfeit. And I felt terrible. And I, there's no argument. I refunded his money, right? I, there was nothing, for, no platform for me to stand on here and argue back. I, I apologize right away. Um, he said he appreciated that, and we've done, we've done business since. Um, but I didn't really have much money built up at that point because I would just like sell and spend and sell and trade and all that sorts of stuff. And so I just authorized eBay to give the refund. And it was a couple hundred dollars. And because the, the funds were not in eBay to do it, it came from our, either from our credit card or, or our checking account. I forget where it came from. And um, so I, anyway, I told my wife, I'm like, yeah, just so you know, you're going to see this expense come out. It's because I accidentally sold somebody a counterfeit card. And... I mean, she was cool with it. Um, she was not happy that that kind of money was coming out of our account. But that was the first and last time that I had to experience what it was like to use family funds for hobby expenses. And I never want to feel that again. So let's bring this back around to the idea of being a self-sustained hobbyist. What is a self-sustained hobbyist? A self-sustained hobbyist is one whose entire hobby portfolio, whose hobby experience is compartmentalized away from all other expenses. It happens within this bubble that if you are a collector and not necessarily if you are if you are you know if you own your own shop if this is your business you're not the one that I'm talking to right now I appreciate you listening but I'm talking to to collectors high end low end doesn't matter what but if you're able to compartmentalize your hobby expenses what it does is it takes so much of what could be stressful in this job and it puts it into this perspective of, well, I'm going to use a gambling term here. You're playing with house money. If you lose it, if you lose it all, if you decide to consolidate everything and go for that one giant RPA of the latest football prospect, I think I'm just going to try it one time, see what happens. And that prospect is no good. If that prospect just doesn't have the it factor and you've dropped, I don't know, $11,000 on a card and that price of the card goes down to 500 bucks. if you did this with Zach Wilson, but if you did it in a compartmentalized fashion where it doesn't affect your quote-unquote real life, what that does is it creates a cushion, for me anyway, where I can just breathe a little bit easier. No one wants to lose money. I've never spent anywhere near that much on a card. But if I ever did, which I won't, but if I ever did and I went for it and it turned out to be a failure, but to know that I didn't disrupt the family in any way whatsoever and all I had to do was sell 500 cards to be able to pay for it, just think about how calming that can be to the mind, knowing you are not negatively affecting anybody else who is in your close emotional circle. Your partners, your kids, your friends. No one gets negatively affected. This card. 
I looked it up recently, the Jordan, in preparation for this podcast. I looked up to see what it went for recently as a PSA 10. It's no longer in that 800 range. But because it's kind of cool that he's playing baseball, because it's upper deck, and because he's Jordan, it still go. It hasn't dipped the way a lot of other cards have. It still goes in the mid-500 range. I've thought about buying it back, not at that price. I thought about buying it raw, which I can probably buy for about 10 to 15 bucks. In fact, I saw it at my LCS a couple of months back, and I saw it. It was a PSA 7. It was in the bin for something like $15, I think. And I thought, I should just buy that because of what that card represents. But I didn't. And the reason I didn't want it is because I don't need a physical representation of what that card means. That card, I think about that card literally daily. That is the card that has allowed me to jump into this hobby. It's the one that allows me to, when I want to make a move, to make a move. Because it brings with it the peace of mind of knowing that I'm acting responsibly. Lastly, I want to say, that I understand there are different strokes for different folks. I understand that people are in different places in the hobby. I am so far from perfect. I have swung and missed so many times that if you saw my track record, you would wonder if I was just buying cards with my eyes closed. What I'm talking about today is not what cards you buy. I'm talking about how you buy them and how you feel after you buy them and the method by which one buys them. And so I am forever grateful that young me decided to put that Jordan card into a top loader and decided to put it into a safe box for about 25 years until I found it. I'm grateful that my family and I went down to visit my dad on that warm fall weekend in 2019. And I'm grateful that while I was selling every other card that I grew up with, that I held that one back. Because that's why I'm here. Without that, I would be talking about my card experience in the past tense. I might be saying to someone, oh yeah, I I went back and got the cards out of my dad's house a few years ago, and I sold them, it was great. Yep, made a couple thousand bucks, loved it. Instead, here I am, talking to you, appreciating you, Thanks again for listening and uh, doing something pretty cool next week. So I hope you jump back in next week. And until then, have a great week and uh, happy collecting. The Shallow End is a Wolfpack Network podcast. The song is Legendary by Black Box. Black Box, play us out.